beer. It's the most popular alcoholic beverage in the world. Crafted from natural ingredients, it's made and served in most countries around the globe. It's older than ancient Egypt and has a history of healing what ails you. And whether you enjoy yours in a bottle, a frosty mug, or a European hot tub, yes, in a hot tub, there's a lot more amazing things to know about this superstar of social drinks on How Stuff Works. Beer is the most consumed alcoholic beverage in the world. Worldwide, over 42 billion gallons are produced every year. In the U.S. alone, adults drink over 7.4 billion gallons a year. Brewing beer requires more than mixing a handful of ingredients together to meet consumer demand. What's amazing about this wildly popular drink is that a complex series of biochemical reactions must take place to make it happen. This giant industry bubbles over with innovation and creativity. Competing side by side with the big brewers are a unique class of fearless craft brewers and even thousands of diehard beer lovers who cook beer up at home. Did you ever think you could major in it? Well, there are even college universities that offer master's degrees in brewing. Beer boasts a host of health benefits, like antioxidants that are good for your heart, and a hot new way to combat stress. So whether you like to drink beer or soak in it, there's no denying its strong appeal. When somebody tells me that they don't like beer, I say I don't believe you. I can find a beer that you will like. Simply put, beer is a fermented, hop-flavored, malt-sugared liquid. Its popularity is due to many factors. Besides taste, affordability and availability don't hurt. There are over 3,000 breweries in Europe and another 1,400 in the U.S. alone. Their sizes vary from small microbreweries that produce less than 15,000 barrels per year to the larger independent brewers, known as craft brewers, who make up to 2 million barrels. But you could say they're a couple of pints in a barrel compared to Anheuser-Busch, the maker of Budweiser, which sells yearly over 160 million barrels in the U.S. One thing does unite the majority of breweries, no matter what size they are, and that's beer's ingredients. Turns out, the majority of beers are essentially comprised of only four. Beer is only beer as defined by the federal government if it has four ingredients in it. And what are they? Barley, or another fermentable starch source like wheat or rice. Hops, flowers from a plant in the hemp family. Yeast, a single cell fungus and water. The amount of ingredients added can vary from brewer to brewer, but this is the basic recipe at Sierra Nevada Craft Brewery in Chico, California, for one barrel of their pale ale. 29 gallons of water, 12 ounces of hops, two pounds of yeast, and 55 pounds of malted barley. The beauty of the ingredients is that they're available to every brewer in every corner of the world. You know, unlike the wine world, you only have these certain geographic pockets where wine is made because wineries have to be right next to the grapes when they're harvested. In the beer world, we have the luxury of having very durable ingredients. But no matter where beer is made, the way it's brewed is also essentially the same. How to make beers is, is universally known. Whether you're doing it in your kitchen, or you're doing it at a microbrewery, or you're doing it at a 60 million barrel brewery like St. Louis. It's a complicated process at that, but there are some key steps. The first step in making beer transforms barley. It's known as malting. Little grains of barley fill massive steel vats and are soaked in water, which allows the grains to germinate or begin sprouting. This softens the grain and also delivers the, the classic malty flavor. Uh, the malty flavor you get in beer, but also other types of foods as well. After germination, the barley is dried. The more the barley is dried, the darker and more roasted the beer tastes. 
the barley now gets a new name, malt. Then the malted grain is ground or milled to make a powder that is mixed with water and heated. Enzymes from the malt break down available starches and produce fermentable sugars. The resulting liquid is now called wort. This mixture is put into a vessel called a louder ton, where the wort is separated from the grains. The wort is boiled with hops to provide bitterness and a beer's unique nose or aroma. After cooling, yeast is added to start the fermentation stage. Yeast allows beer's full flavor to peak while it converts the remaining sugars into carbon dioxide and alcohol, giving beer its carbonation and alcohol content. So with brewers using the same four basic ingredients and using the basic brewing processes, how do we end up with thousands of unique styles of beer to choose from? Beer making is not the wild, wild west. It's the wild, wide open world. From the home brewers to the big guys, there's room for a lot of creative cookery. I've traveled the world. I've met lots of brewers. And the one unique aspect about the people that make beer is that they're passionate about what they're doing. Great brewers are like great chefs, using their own special combinations of barley, hops, and bubbling yeast. Another factor that alters the style of a beer is the amount of alcohol in each brand. How much alcohol in a brand of beer is partially determined by government regulations, which differ in each country and state, but mostly it's driven by consumer demand. The percentage of alcohol in a single beer runs from an average 3% to over 10, and even as high as 17.5% in some specialty beers. Still, with so many different beers available around the world, the majority of well-known styles fall into just two categories, ales and lagers. Ales, which include stouts, India pale ales, lambics, wheat beers, and porters, are known to have heavier, fruitier flavors. Lagers, which include pilsners, box, schwarzbier, and malt liquors, are generally crisper and cleaner tasting. But it's not just the flavor that distinguishes an ale from a lager. It's the way they're fermented. A lager is just a generic term for bottom fermented beer, OK? And when you add the yeast in primary fermentation, we start creating that alcohol and start creating CO2. And eventually, the yeast will start settling to the bottom of the fermenter. In, in very simple terms, that's a lager. An ale uses a different type of yeast. And you start creating the alcohol, and the yeast rises to the top. Ales are generally fermented warmer, about 15 degrees warmer than a lager, so it provides a completely different flavor. Now your favorite brand might come light. If so, you're not alone. Bud Light is the largest selling beer in the world. Light beer is basically lager beer, brewed to have lower levels of calories, carbohydrates, and often less alcohol. Bud Light has a truly unique brewing process. It, it takes probably twice as long in the brew house to make a Bud Light. While both beers are lagers, Bud and Bud Light are made with different proportions of grains and hops. The grains for Bud Light are cooked in the mash tun for a longer amount of time and at lower temperatures. This converts more starches to fermentable sugars, which reduces the calories in the beer overall. An original Budweiser brewed in the U.S. contains 5% alcohol, 143 calories, and 10.6 carbs, while a Bud Light weighs in with 4.2% alcohol, 110 calories, and 6.6 .6 carbs. Now, if what you're looking for is a beer containing no alcohol, proceed with caution. Beer that's labeled non-alcoholic doesn't necessarily mean it contains no alcohol. The legal definition in the U.S. is less than 0.5% alcohol by volume, so the amount can vary by brewer. With the variety of styles across the globe, you can think of the family of beer as the United Nation of Beverages. Barley is the powerhouse ingredient of beer. This cereal grain not only gives beer some of its great flavor and color, but it also provides a key element for the brewing process. The soul of beer is malted barley. 
cultivated barley belongs to the grass family. 10,000 years ago, it was one of the first domesticated crops in the Middle East. It's also considered the impetus behind the very first beer, which is widely believed to have been invented completely by accident. Beer goes back probably around 8,000 years to the Fertile Crescent, which is modern-day Iraq. The theory is it all began when someone got a hold of some sprouted barley. They most likely found out if they dried it, they got something they could bake into a loaf of bread. This bread crumbled into a liquid, fermented, and cheers, ancient beer had arrived. Most breweries buy their barley already malted, which means the grain has already germinated and dried. But the Pilsner Urquell Brewery in Pilsen, Czech Republic, have held onto the tradition of producing their own malted barley for over 150 years. We produce our own malt from 1842 when we started production in Pilsen Urquell. The process of this malting takes about five, six days. After uh, germination, we dry it uh, because uh, we should store it and transport to brewing house. And in this uh, saladin box, uh, it's called this equipment, uh, we have about 200,000 uh, tons of malt. It's about three and a half million bottles of Pilsner Urquell. The Czechs love their beer so much that they have the highest per capita consumption, 35.2 gallons per person per year, which is why this country is considered the number one beer drinking nation in the world. One of the most distinguishing factors of Czech beer is that it's made with 100% barley malt, generally speaking and uh, they tend to be very full flavored and very heavy and hefty beers. But the Czechs are far from the only fans of beers with a lot of barley flavor. Ken Grossman, founder of Sierra Nevada Brewery in Chico, California, produces a wide range of beers and knows the importance of barley in every batch he brews. What we're looking at here is the mash tun and we're transferring the malted barley. It's been in here about an hour and a half. Uh, it's at about 160 degrees. We've converted all those starches into sugars, and now we're pumping the whole mash on into the louder ton. And if you see, we're just about empty here. Um, there's an agitator that's stirring this, and depending on what temperatures we keep the mash at, that'll determine the characteristic of the beer, whether it's a, a, a lighter flavored beer with low alcohol or whether it's a sweeter flavored beer. So the next time you enjoy a beer, take a closer look at the color and taste. If it's dark and has a roasted flavor, you can thank those little grains of barley. Holy hair of the dog. It was beer brewing monks in 1200 AD that first discovered that adding a small grain flour would give their beer a distinctive bitter edge. The little flour is called hops, and it comes in many varieties, which is why it's often referred to as the spice of beer. Hops is what gives the bitterness to counterbalance the sweetness of the barley. Uh, even a relatively light uh, beer would taste uh, cloyingly sweet if it didn't have some volume of hops in it. Hops is a little flower or cone from the female hop, a plant in the hemp family. Yes, that notorious family that produces marijuana. It's not hard to spot a hop field. They're pretty distinctive because the plants are grown in rows on strings. What I'm doing there is breaking down the, the glands, the lupinin glands, to release the resins. Inside the bracteal layer of the female hop cone are the wax-coated lupulin glands. These house a yellow powder or pollen, which is made up of bitter resins and aromatic oils. Combined, these give hops their bitter flavor when they're tossed into a steaming brew kettle and boiled. The bitter compounds, the resins, also have other influences. Uh, they help stabilize the foam. They are also antimicrobial, so they're uh, important for preventing bacteria from growing in the beer. After malt is added to warm water and beer begins to brew, the mixture tastes very sweet. That's exactly when brewers add hops to balance the sweet taste with a little bitterness and create a more harmonious flavor. 
Like most breweries, Anheuser-Busch uses a form of crushed or dried hops. You see, we're in the hop room now. These are hop pellets. You can see right now what a hop looks like when we use it. The Sierra Nevada Brewery produces 750,000 barrels per year. Since we really focus and feature hops in our beers, hops really are the most critical uh, ingredient for us. In fact, they grow three acres of their own hops. We have uh, been growing our own hops here at the brewery for the last uh, four years. You know, in the same way that there's deadheads, there are hop heads out there, and it's a growing uh, contingent of people who are looking for to challenge their taste buds. It's good. Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Milton, Delaware, is known for creating cutting edge or hybrid beers using ingredients from vanilla beans to honey and grapes. This is orange blossom honey. We have pureed raisins. But hops still tips the scales when it comes to adding powerful flavor. I believe we use the highest volume of hops per barrel of any brewery in the country. That's because we brew such a high volume of IPAs, India Pale Ales, which are a very hoppy style. Hops is generally added to the boil kettle only once during the brewing process. But that isn't enough for dogfish. To further enhance the flavor of some of their beers, they devised a way to keep the hops coming. We even invented our own little continual hopping device. Our IPAs are the only continually hopped IPAs in the world. And by dosing a little bit of hops in the entire time you brew, instead of what the tradition is, is dumping giant volumes of hops in once or twice, by dosing it in in little increments, it makes for a beer that's intensely hoppy without being crushingly bitter. Not only do great brewers act like chefs, some like Sam are part inventors. Beer has developed into such big business that brewing's become a competitive and very academic science. Beer is so, so complex. Uh, it's a really detailed science and, and technology. The, the whole journey from barley through to, to beer, with the flavoring by the hops and the action of the yeast, there's a rich mine of, of science to be studied there. And Dr. Bamforth would know. He runs one of only two brewing programs in the U.S. at the University of California at Davis, where students can actually earn a master's degree in the art of brewing. Uh, science is incredibly important in the brewing of beer, particularly in trying to strive to create a consistent product. Every aspect of beer is studied, from the color to the taste, and right down to the consistency of the foam. And why are they so interested in foam? Technically, it doesn't change or even add to the flavor of beer, but that doesn't seem to matter because in the world of beer, good foam is good for business. Currently, I work on beer foam, so I look at what kills a good beer foam and how to make a good foam more stable. The machine that we use to test it basically turns the beer all into foam and then measures the rate of collapse of that foam. Foam forms because of dissolved carbon dioxide gas, CO2, that occurs as a result of the fermentation process. Foam is kind of complicated, depends on uh, how you pour it, and then how stable it is, and depends how long you leave it, because if you take a lot of sips, then the foam texture will change, it will lace inside of the beer glass, and so on. To me, you pour that beer in a glass, you want foam. You haven't even tasted it, you haven't even smelled it yet, but you're looking at it, First impressions are everything. Yeast is a critical ingredient in beer that has the incredible ability to start the fermentation process, which turns sugars during the brewing process into alcohol. There have been examples of bottles of beer that have been found in shipwrecks that even though they are hundreds of years old, they could take that bottle, isolate that yeast, feed it some sugar, and grow it up, allowing brewers to step back in time and make beer with these ancient yeasts. In a laboratory at Sierra Nevada, they propagate or reproduce their own yeast. In fact, they have been using the same strain since the day they began brewing in 1980. So this is uh, a yeast slurry that was taken out of a uh, fermenter. And so this is the active yeast that's in one of our fermentation tanks. In this sample here, there's literally millions of yeast cells. Um, so in a milliliter, there may be 10 to 15 million cells or even up to 40 or 50 million cells of yeast actively fermenting the sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide. 
Andy Treacrum, brewmaster at Dogfish Head Craft Brewery, never takes his eye off his special strains. Brewers are basically yeast wranglers. That's what we do. We, we play with yeast all day, and if our yeast is happy, then the beer tastes good. If the yeast is not happy, uh, then the brewer is not happy. The little fungi can be temperamental if they're not kept in the proper environment. This is just for growing yeast. We put it in this clean room environment, which we tiled all the walls. We put a HEPA filtered air so we don't have any microbial issues. There's no mold or bacteria that can live in this room. Uh, it's a very, very sanitary environment. The word yeast comes from the Old English word, meaning bubble, boil, or foam. Fitting, it would be an essential ingredient for one of the world's favorite frothy drinks. Fermentation is the last big step in making beer, a process that many say is where the magic happens. It's when sugars from the malt are metabolized into alcohol. What's amazing is it's a natural process that occurs completely on its own. It's an act of nature that has mystified people since the beginning of time. The fermentation process is like something otherworldly because it just happens by itself. You can't see the yeasts and things are bubbling and churning and so forth. This was incorporated into the religion. So how in the world is the process of fermentation triggered by yeast cells? Molecules of glucose or sugar enter the yeast cells through diffusion. The yeast cells break down the glucose molecules, which then resupply energy back to the yeast cells allowing them to continue to reproduce and convert the rest of the glucose molecules into carbon dioxide and ethanol, the alcohol in beer. Budweiser's operation is massive every step of the process, including fermentation. We're in Stockhouse 20 right now. This is a fermentation cellar. We have 12 vessels in this cellar, each one holding 5,600 barrels of beer. Altogether, we have 37 fermentation tanks. Each tank will be filled for about five or six days until the yeast has finished out and started settling to the bottom. Like Budweiser, most breweries wrap up their brewing process by allowing their beer to ferment in sealed steel tanks. Sierra Nevada does that too. However, they mix it up a bit by allowing some of their beer to ferment in a more traditional way, in open fermenters. It's not every day you get to see gallons of bubbling yeast cells exposed to open air. They do this for the flavor that it yields in some of their favorite ales. Pilsner Urquell in the Czech Republic produces 1.5 million pints of beer a day. They have a unique twist to evaluating quality control. Even though they ferment most of their beer in stainless steel tanks, to make absolutely sure nothing changes from their original 150 plus year old recipe, each year a certain amount of beer is brewed the really old fashioned way, by fermenting hop wort in old oak barrels. We are here in historical cellars of Pilsner Orquia. You can see all these coil corridors, it's more than six miles. Both batches of beer are regularly taste tested to make sure there is no difference between the traditional and the current brew. And why the candle? Along with lighting their way, it's an old custom for brewmasters to hold a candle to a glass of beer as a way of checking its color and clarity. Now we are in maturation cellars. Uh, here is developed the final taste and aroma of the beer. And uh, I would explain you what is different uh, on Pilsner Urquell. If you will taste Pilsner Urquell on the first sip, you, you will feel the bitterness on the, in your mouth. But after two, three seconds, uh, this bitterness is well balanced with sweetness of rest extract uh, in this beer. And in build you uh, thirsty and you will ask to another sip. And this is called drinkability. And Pils Norwell is famous with excellent drinkability. Cheers.
You can buy beer almost anywhere, but one of the fastest growing hobbies is making it at home. It's estimated there are now over a half a million people brewing their own in the U.S. alone, and their ranks keep growing. And these home brewers believe that their finely crafted brews are as good or better than anything out there. That's why most Sunday afternoons, Dave Fitch mixes up a batch of beer on his personal portable brewery out in front of Maltos Express, a home brew retail store in Monroe, Connecticut. Today I'm making an India Pale Ale. I've been brewing about 15 years. The kit I originally got was a gift from my now ex-wife. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of science involved with it as well, and I'm not really a scientist, but it is pretty interesting. Hi, can I help you? For less than $100, you can buy a pre-packaged starter kit, which contains everything you'll need to make about five gallons of beer. You can even get the recipes for some of your favorite well-known beers. Oh, sometimes a six-year-old you have to grind twice, remember? The clone kits give people a way to make a beer they like. You walk in and you just get the ingredients in a box and walk out, but then they can alter the recipe a little bit to suit their taste. If you're brave enough to give home brewing a try, the challenges might seem a bit daunting, but don't give up too soon. There are people out there more than willing to help. Can you boil water? Sure. Then you can make beer. You get a how-to book, 7.8 gallon primary fermenter, airlock, stopper, five gallon glass carboy, sanitizing solution. This is your hydrometer. This is for testing the alcohol content of your beer. And then you would need a 20 quart stainless steel kettle. This is your thermometer. Now your bottle filler is a spring-loaded bottom. And your capper. It's really declaring your independence. Every batch of beer you make is unique. It has your personality in it. It's a community thing. And you can tell, you know, right. it was a new hop. <laughs> <laughs> In the neighboring town of Reading, home brewer Tom McGlinovich is doing what he loves to do best, brew beer and teach his neighbor how it's done. We're gonna pull the coil out. Out of the work, we're gonna close this again. Ready? Yep, here we go. Lift. Tom's beers win prizes, including several blue ribbons from the National Home Brew Competition. He's an engineer by profession and brings precision and a love of problem solving to his beer making. And it was no problem for Tom to find a place to practice his passion for beer. His laundry room doubles as his brewery. Okay. And this thermometer reads approximately 74 degrees Fahrenheit. After measuring the temperature of the wort, Tom takes a measurement called specific gravity. Since alcohol is lighter than water, if the reading shows a drop in gravity, Tom will know his beer is almost ready. Beer brewing is, uh, is, is part art and part science. And I take that measurement because that, that way I can tell how much fermentable sugars are in the wort. It tells me how strong my beer is going to be. OK, what we're going to do now is just going to transfer the, uh, the wrecking cane from one. Using a plastic tube device, Tom siphons off the wort into a glass carboy or jug. And after you do this for about 400 or 450 times, you kind of get the hang of it after a while. What's actually left in the bottom of the kettle is uh, all the hops that we use today. Primary fermentation will be uh, probably about two weeks. It's going to remain over here in the corner. Nice and cool. This is a, a very good temperature for a scotch ale. Like the thousands of other home brewmeisters across America, there's only one question ever on Tom's mind. Why do I love to home brew? It's hot out here today. I think I need a beer. The benefits of being a home brewer is the fact that I can go into my man cave and I can pour myself a, a fresh home brew. Now, how many people have a, a variety of beer in their refrigerator in their basement? Oh, that's good. There's a whole world of beer makers out there known as craft brewers, whose creativity, tenacity, and fearlessness is keeping the beer industry on its toes. Small craft brewers are commercial breweries that produce fewer than two million barrels of beer a year. Many are boutique operations that have much more latitude to experiment with different ingredients. 
and at Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Delaware? They do. If we can catch up to it, run it over, we can, and we'll rip it off the road and throw it in the brew kettle, you know? We're pretty fearless in what we put into our brews. Their motto is off-centered ales for off-centered people. The opportunity to use non-traditional ingredients just really got me thinking that I could kind of put my own thumbprint on beer. And true to form, Sam makes some pretty crazy beers. Everything from a pumpkin ale to a chicory stout to a beer called Raison d'Etre. A brown ale brewed with malt, beet sugar, and raisins. If there's a secret to our success in brewing, it's because we're not afraid. We will try just about anything as long as it tastes good. Some of their other unique ingredients include hot chili peppers, maple syrup, juniper berries, honey, grapes, saffron, and licorice root. I think brewing should be recognized as an art form just as, uh, you know, painting or sculpting or anything else is. And, you know, that's why uh, it's been around for, for centuries, is people feel closer to the gods when they uh, brush up against fermented beverages, and that's a beautiful thing. And that's why Sam reached out to Dr. Patrick McGovern, senior research scientist at the Pennsylvania Museum's Applied Science Center for Archaeology. He's famous for his discovery of the oldest known beer in history. You know, this beverage has been lost, uh, essentially, to humanity for thousands of years. Dr. McGovern hit the primordial lottery when he got a hold of some ancient pottery excavated from a site in Honduras. Through the use of infrared spectrometry and chemical analysis on scrapings from pottery shards, he was able to identify ingredients similar to those found in beers today. He surmised that somewhere between 1100 and 1200 BC, people were drinking a fermented beverage made from the sweet pulp of the cacao fruit, the source of modern day chocolate. We got the tools, you know, now to really reconstruct a lot of what the organic um, ancient world was like. With the exciting prospect of reaching back in time to create something out of this world, they just couldn't resist. Okay, we only need a quarter. So Sam, Patrick, and Brian Selders, Dogfish's senior brewmaster, set up their own mini lab in order to recreate the ancient beer. The first afternoon is crucial, concocting the brew with their recipe of special ingredients. Aztec cocoa powder, cocoa nibs, honey, chilies, some fragrant tree seeds called annatto, and corn, an ingredient used in many ancient beverages. Corn beer was very intense reddish color to the beverage. Is that more than a quarter of an ounce? The red is important to this beer because the Mayans and the Aztecs actually associated the chocolate beverage with blood. So red, you know, equals blood. What the ancient Americans did was they would sacrifice on the top of their pyramids. And uh, when they did the sacrifice, if the person was any way reluctant, you know, to have themselves sacrificed, they would serve up a chocolate beverage in which had been mixed blood from the, the previous sacrifice, so th th that would give the person courage to go on with the sacrifice. We've upped the volumes of cocoa to make it more prevalent in the taste and aroma, and we move the addition of the cocoa powder to later in the process. A quarter ounce of chili adds a dried fruit flavor without really delivering the heat. So uh, here we have our dried chili pods, so we're gonna hydrate them so by the time they're added to the wort, they're soft enough that they'll break down and we'll get a lot more of the flavors. This is the first time in the United States that we have put together a beverage that really draws upon these ancient chocolate drinks in a way that's never been done before. Well, we'll see if it flies, but that... <laughs> can you smell it already, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, I can, can you pick it up. There's still a lot of barley malt uh, aroma, too. Does it take I a while? I love that smell. And now we wait. <laughs> they figure it will take four weeks to brew and two weeks more for fermentation. To make sure the chocolate matures to the desired flavor, they allow for an additional 14 days for the cocoa nibs to settle. They named the beer Theobroma, 
which is the chemical signature of the cacao plant, only found in Central America. It also means food of the gods. There she is. <laughs> Finally, Sam is able to put their labors to the test to see how this ancient chocolate beer fares in a modern day pub. It doesn't taste like a chocolate bar. It tastes more of cocoa bean, cocoa flavors. But we're actually bringing back to life beverages that haven't existed for thousands of years. And surprise, surprise, you know, people actually enjoy these beverages. And it shows you that humans through the ages have, you know, had very similar tastes. There's some good health news out there if you drink an occasional beer. Turns out that beer contains antioxidants, substances that protect cells. Beer actually does contain a lot of nutrition, uh, and it's certainly not empty calories, which some people believe it to be. One antioxidant in particular, ferulic acid, has been shown to be readily absorbed by the body through drinking beer. If I go down to my local farmer's market and say, here's a tomato, here's a bottle of beer, which is more helpful, well, at least in this antioxidant, it would be the beer. Additional research on antioxidants has shown other physical benefits as well. One of the effects of the antioxidants in beer is to increase the production of a molecule called nitric oxide. This is a gas that's actually produced in your blood vessels and relaxes them, uh, leading to a reduction in blood pressure and a reduction in heart disease risk and stroke risk. Beer is also a significant source of some B vitamins and silicon. Beer and bananas are the two richest sources of silicon in the diet. Now there's a lot of evidence to suggest that moderate consumption of beer will reduce the late onset of osteoporosis. But beer also has the ability to alter your mind and body in some other not so healthy ways. Like all alcoholic beverages, if abused, it can cause serious physical damage. Even just one too many can produce in many drinkers a pleasant though not normal feeling that has been known to people throughout the ages, inebriation. When our species first appeared in Africa, one of the things that they would have been drawn to is the alcoholic content. And especially, uh, not, not just to preserve the food, but also to change, have mental effects produced by it. When alcohol enters your body, 20% of it is absorbed into the bloodstream through the stomach walls. The other 80% through the small intestine. Water in your body dilutes the alcohol, but it also helps it travel more efficiently. When the alcohol reaches the central nervous system, intoxication occurs because the alcohol affects the ability of the nerve cells to transmit signals. Beer can affect a number of neurological functions, including your ability to speak. It will slur your speech. It will slow your body movements and your ability to work. Everybody's different, but the general rule is if you haven't eaten for a while and drink alcohol in an empty stomach, Having more than one drink every two hours will impair your reaction time. Beer tends to have about 12% alcohol, uh, which is about the same amount of alcohol that one would get in one shot of whiskey or in one cup of wine. A full glass of beer such as this would contain about one ounce of pure alcohol, demonstrated here by this shot glass. So like many mothers have always said, everything is best in moderation and that includes beer. Beer baths? Actually soaking in a hot tub of brew? Leave it to the Czechs. The Czech Republic, and especially this part of the Czech Republic, has a long tradition of balneology, that is uh, bathing and healing people with curative baths. You heard it right. Chodovar, a family-owned brewery in Chodova Plana, offers a refreshing alternative to your average jacuzzi. Down in the cellar of the brewery's hotel, there's a unique spa with six steel tubs filled with golden beer. This brewery is known for producing its own mineral water to drink. And in addition to producing a kind of healthy, uh, salubrious bathing experience that's supposed to be good for people and, and cure what ails you. Yeah, the people come from all Europe, all over the world. I think we'd all tend to agree that bathing in beer is an unusual idea. But as it turns out, it may not be a new one. Rumor has it that it dates back to the Egyptians. 
The beer bars is have a lot of oxygen and the oxygen is really good for the blood pressure. It's very good for the skin, for the hair and for the nails. Along with 20 minutes of soaking in pure beer heaven, the beer spa offers a taste of their house brew. In addition to baths, actual places to bathe in beer, they have a place to lie down and relax because it's so relaxing, you generally fall straight asleep. From the brew kettles to lauder tons and on to the fermentation tanks, all great beers begin with a combination of some of nature's finest ingredients, like barley. The soul of beer. Hops. The hop makes a huge contribution to the quality of the beer. Water. Over the centuries, different styles of beer have evolved due to chemical composition of the water. And finally, yeast, the ingredient behind perhaps the most mystical process of all. Fermentation is a beautifully magical process, and you know that's why it's been around for centuries. From ancient recipes resurrected to the modern science of brewing, there's a whole new world of taste possibilities waiting to be explored. The wonderful thing about our beer culture is it's all about discovery. It's not just what it used to be years ago, a refreshing beverage in the middle of the summer or when you're thirsty. It's m much more than that. So I see the future being more like what our ancestors were all about, which is let's not pay attention to styles, let's pay attention to flavors. Back to the future is where we're going. Cheers. Close.